my favorite definition of boundaries is that it's synonymous with naming a need that comes out of feeling either unsafe or uncomfortable about something. And so there are really two parts to um, doing this work of naming a boundary. The first is saying, hey, I'm becoming aware I've got a need around this. And then we communicate that to another person. And if that need is met, great. If it isn't, this is where the work really picks up. We then decide how we will change our code of conduct. The behavior change isn't that someone else we're going to enforce you know, a consequence on them. We decide how I will change my behavior if this need isn't able to be met. Welcome to the Faithful and True Podcast. Today we've got special guests, Beth Miller and Elizabeth Hardesty. Uh, Beth is an MA with uh, she together with her husband, Greg. They are the directors of Faithful and True's workshops. Uh, Beth specifically is very involved in leading the Women's Journey Workshop and uh, also the Couples Journey Workshop. As we've mentioned before, Greg is our director of men's workshops as well, and they're just a fantastic team that uh, lead all of those intensives. Uh, together with Beth Hardesty of Beth is LPCC. I'm giving all these credentials now because people have just been clamoring to know who these very well-informed guests on our show uh, are. Uh, Greg, of course, is both a D-min and an M-div. Uh, if you know your cred uh, your credentials, uh, I am a pastoral uh, co-host. Uh, that's a title <laughs> I just made up this afternoon <laughs> that made me sound like I know what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, actually, here at Faithful and True, I'm the director. Of so we're happy to have you all with us today. Uh, how is everybody doing? Doing well. We're doing great. Doing well, thanks for letting we're us starting be here. We're starting to enjoy spring, so we are yes, very thankful for finally. that in the upper Midwest. We thought it would never get here. Uh, today is a great day to have this conversation that we're going to have regarding boundaries. Yes, and so in our conversations, um, one of the things that we know that comes up a lot, especially in the context of coupleships, and yet the idea of boundaries is so much more than that. It's about how we relate to our children, our parents, our coworkers. Um, and one of the ways that we talk about boundaries is that boundaries, when they are drawn well, um, they create safety. And so that's one of the criteria that we're going to be looking at. So um, Elizabeth and Beth, how do you want to start? What does it sound like for us to begin to talk about boundaries? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for having us, by the way. And I would say the very first thing that I would name is a definition of boundaries. And my favorite definition of boundaries is that it's synonymous with naming a need that comes out of feeling either unsafe or uncomfortable about something. And so there are really two parts to um, doing this work of naming a boundary. The first is saying, hey, I'm becoming aware I've got a need around this. And then we communicate that to another person and if that need is met, great. If it isn't, this is where um, the work really picks up. And this is where we then decide how we will change our code of conduct. The behavior change isn't that someone else we're going to enforce you know, a consequence on them. We decide how I will change my behavior if this need isn't able to be met. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things I would say is, even as you're beginning the conversation, this is really challenging for people, especially if growing up, their needs were not validated. Um, mm -hmm. It may be hard to even say what my need is. I just have an awareness that something is off or I don't feel safe, but I may not be able to identify why I don't feel safe. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. I would agree, Greg. I think this really is a re like a reframing, a, a different way to think about it. That you know, our our belief is that uh, boundaries really are um, an act of love. Like they're an act of love for yourself, right? Just recognizing what your own needs are for safety, for love, and it really is an act of love for the other person, because we really believe that this. Um, that healthy boundaries and respecting of healthy boundaries is what can lead to deep connection, mm -hmm. deep level of safety. But, you know, for, an in, for a relationship to really thrive and have that deep level of connection, there needs to be that foundation of safety. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, one of, the, one of the things that we talk about at the workshop is that there is a progression. So we try to create safety because if people are safe enough, then they are vulnerable enough and then they can be transformed enough. And in the context of relationships, if I'm safe enough, then I will be vulnerable enough. And that leads to the intimacy that I desire. But if I'm not safe, if I don't perceive that I'm safe, then I will not be vulnerable. And therefore, the intimacy I desire will not be realized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the things that I want to just acknowledge as we're getting going here is that boundaries are a really complex topic. Mm -hmm. And there's so much written about them. Um, there's a lot of different views of how to set them, what they are, how to enforce them, um, all of those things. And I just want to say for anyone listening, if you've ever found this to be complicated and complex, you're not wrong. Mm -hmm. This is hard work. And there are some reasons, you know, like Greg, like you said, uh, one of the first things, if we're going to define a boundary as a need that we're recognizing we're having, maybe we didn't grow up, and many of us didn't, getting asked what our needs were, um, getting asked what we needed, being allowed to even name our needs, that's going to be really challenging. And I, I think it's good to name, um, okay, so if this is what a boundary is, Let's also talk about what a boundary isn't. Elizabeth, do you have some thoughts about that? I do. And I think this is where we, you know, we see this sometimes that there's just this confusion about what a boundary is and what a boundary isn't. And so just some things that we want to point out, you know, a boundary is not uh, setting or creating a consequence for someone else, right? It's not, it's not a punishment. This is not um, something that we are doing to inflict on someone else. This really is start like coming from the self and starting with the self. This is not about fixing another person, controlling another person's behavior. This really is coming from, again, from that intrinsic place of, of, of it's, be, it's about me. It's not about an, the other person. Yeah. Oh, okay. So Elizabeth, given that understanding, is it appropriate to use the idea of pound, uh, boundary when you're parenting small children where there could be a consequence given the choice that they make or don't make. Mm -hmm. So is that about a boundary or is that simply an, something else about parenting and we would use a different term? I, th I think there maybe would be a different term in that because I think it's going to be, it's going to come across a little differently when we are, when we're parenting a child who needs to be parented, you know, there, mm -hmm. ne there needs to be some structure. There needs to be some guidelines they're not able to make some of those choices for themselves, right? This is really more of this place of surrender of I'm recognizing what I need to, to keep myself safe, to feel healthy. I cannot control or make you do these things, but I need so, but I to do my part to state that. So some, some of the concepts in the language may be similar between a parent and a small child, but really what we're talking about here is when you're engaging adult relationships and trying to figure out how to create safety in the context of those relationships. Right. Yes. Well, and I'm so glad you brought that up, Greg, because one of the things that can happen is if we're not careful and we're believing that boundaries are setting consequences for someone else, and we're talking about an adult to adult relationship, it creates more of a parent child mm -hmm. relationship. And specifically in the case of a husband and a wife, that just um, creates all kinds of chaos for the building of intimacy. Right. And I think it's really, really important to name. That's not what we're talking about. I want to give a brief example that I, I think may be helpful. 
Um, I knew a couple. Does this involve me? It does not. I, I would have asked your permission. I promise. I and, promise. And the use That's of certainly the timeout a possibility. And the right. use of the timeout bench. Yeah, no, it does not involve that. Um, years ago, I knew a couple who volunteered at their church every Monday night, and he loved to be on time. In fact, maybe a little bit early, and he was aware that that really helped his anxiety to show up and get ready for serving with a nice amount of time before the event began. She had a different view of that. She liked to arrive, you know, just in the nick of time. And this became, as you can imagine, a real source of conflict for them. Well, he named a need. Hey, I need to leave earlier. That is my desire so that I'm not feeling anxious about this. And over time, they begin to recognize that either she wasn't able to change her behavior or couldn't, wasn't choosing that, however, you know, was the case. So he changed his behavior. He said, you know what, I'm going to drive because I don't like the anxiety I feel and I don't like how I'm treating you in the process in the car as we're racing to the thing, you know? And so he drove separately. And uh, then at the end of the night, same thing. She liked to stay longer and talk and be more social and he was ready to leave. It was a very loving thing. He loved himself by saying, you know, hey, I, I have this need and I don't wanna get snarky about it or passive aggressive with you. And he was loving her by, you know, some of the same things. I don't want to come at you with my resentment rather than just saying, hey, here's how I'm going to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the things I think is that's really meaningful about that example is he wasn't saying you need to change. You yeah. need to prioritize time. You need to get there. Yes. early. And a lot of times when we have these conversations, we're actually expecting the other person to change. In this particular case, she was, if she was going to continue to leave later than he would want, then he was going to change his behavior to accommodate whatever it was that she was going to do. And I think the significance of this is in this particular case, there were two opposing needs, his need to be there early. She did not have the same need. And so therefore they came up with the solution that was legitimate for both of them that didn't lead to resentment on either one of their parts. Yeah, it's, it's a really big point because, you know, what we don't want, you, you mentioned this earlier, Beth, is, is to create this a, a parent child dynamic yes. where um, the person who the boundary is, is being asked of or being put upon um, feels like you just said, Greg, that sense of resentment or even victim, like where their mm -hmm. choice has been taken from them. Right. Like I, OK, I have to do this thing. My my wife or my husband is telling me I have to leave early or I have to. Um, fill in the blank, right? And this is really about, no, like I'm I'm going to take care of myself. I'm identifying what I need in this. And yet you you have you have choices. You have your own choice of how you want to respond to this. But based on how you respond, I will then make choices of how I'm going to respond. Yeah. And so it really is being careful. This is not punitive. This is not manipulative. This really is about um, giving that freedom, that empowerment on both sides. To, to make the choices that each person needs to make for themselves. Right. Well, and that's what healthy boundaries do, right? Mm -hmm. They empower. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of freedom in um, naming, hey, here's, here's what I need. And then discerning what are my choices if that need can't be met. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of empowerment and freedom in that. One, one thing that, you know, we, we talk about the, the hoops when we talk about coupleship, and it's one of the images that we use at the couples workshop. And one of the ways you can know you're in somebody else's hoop is if you start the conversation you need, you need to do this, you need to do this, mm -hmm. because the reality is the other person may not need to do that. And so by being able to own, this is my need versus imposing yeah. a need on somebody else. Um, so I want to I want to talk a little bit about, so we're talking about boundaries. That's a term that we're familiar with. If you go to therapy long enough or you're in a group long enough, you'll hear about boundaries. What might be some of the indicators of what do you listen to when you're working with women so that you can begin to understand, hey, it would be helpful for us to begin 
to talk about this idea of boundaries because this ultimately is the issue that they're dealing with, even if they don't use that language. Yeah. Well, I, I think there are several indicators. I think one thing that can happen is when um, I'm listening to a woman who is really um, angry and frustrated that her husband isn't, say, in therapy or doing his work or working active recovery um, in a group, um, you know, demonstrating that he is internally motivated to be well, all right? It's understandable that she has anger and fear and chaos around that. When the conversation continues, though, week after week, month after month, about I'm so frustrated that he isn't, you know, fill in the blank, this is when a conversation, and it's probably happened sooner if it's been going on for months, but those are some indications that this is a way that um, a ne naming some needs is going to be helpful and setting boundaries becomes helpful. Mm -hmm. I think we, uh, it, it's an important thing here to talk about, and it was alluded to earlier, but the, 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 diffic the difficulty around this, like this is, this is hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think to even talk a little bit about why, why do we struggle? Why, why is it a struggle to kind of find, find that need to state that need to follow through with that need? I think there's a lot of things here that can become really difficult. You know, it's um, it, it, it definitely, I think along with what Beth was saying, we do check in with feelings. I know for me with sessions, I'm always asking the women, like, how are you feeling? And often that is kind of an indicator of, okay, is there something here that I'm needing? Mm -hmm. But really feeling empowered to make choices for ourselves that are going to lead us um, to, a, to a different place, right? Where we're not just going to perpetually stay in a place of feeling um, scared or feeling unsafe or feeling distrustful. But what do I need mm -hmm. to find my own rug to stand on, as Beth says? Yeah. Well, and one of the things I would say, back to the example that Beth gave, what's powerful about that is the the man was able to identify, my need is not to be early. My need is to be safe. And one of the ways I create safety is by being early for something so that I don't have to rush. You know, it's that idea that anytime there's anxiety involved, there's something typically that, about safety. And so a lot of times I think what happens is we dismiss our needs as trivial. But if I just stop with, well, I need to be early, I might dismiss that. But if I look at what's really going on, then I can begin to understand the validity of the need. And I can mm -hmm. also identify maybe some other way. If it really is about safety, then I can begin to identify what are some of the things that I can do to continue to create safety for myself mm -hmm. in this particular context. Yeah. I I do think that it it's easy in a setting like this for us to name when a woman is say for example not feeling safe then there's a need to name i ha hey i'm aware that for me to feel safe i have a need for you to for example you know get into therapy um get into regularly attending a group for example but like elizabeth was saying earlier I, I really want to validate there are a lot of understandable reasons that we struggle doing this. I mean, if boundary setting was easy, we we wouldn't need to be having this conversation, mm -hmm. right? Right. And I, I was talking with a woman this week. Um, Greg, you mentioned boundaries are across all relationships, you know, not just husband and wife. And the woman said, nobody says no to my mother and lives to tell about it. Nobody, you know. And what that communicates to me is this woman from her very early days paid a high price when she would push back, right? Whatever that was, her mother would have big feelings, either, um, you know, scolding her, or maybe the mother got silent and iced her out, mm -hmm. right? Oftentimes there, there's a price to pay if we're having a voice um, as children. And so it makes sense. And I just want to name 
that there's a lot of dread, anxiety, shame, guilt, that kind of stuff that can come up. I mean, I, you just name the word boundaries or limits, needs, whatever words we're going to use here. And I guarantee that for a lot of people, they start to have some of these really strong, afflictive, big emotions because of some of the difficulty they've had mm-hmm. in years past or a profound fear of disappointing someone mm-hmm. and not disappointing people is how they've kept themselves safe. We're not saying that's a sustainable way to live, but I want to acknowledge that that is a real challenge to even begin talking about this. Well, and, and I would even say part of the reality is using that example that you just did, it, it seems as if there's less cost to just go along with mother. Mm-hmm. That, you know, placating mother, agreeing with mother, and then maybe going off and doing what I want to do. That mm-hmm. feels like that is the easiest solution and the best solution mm-hmm. because I don't, I get to avoid the big reactions or the icing out. One of the things that we have to understand is there is a cost that comes when we don't live in our boundaries, when we don't name our limits. The, the front end cost may be um, less if we agree and just go along to get along. But the back end cost is where we begin to pay. And that especially accumulates over time. Yes. And I think we just want to be, and we are, I think, just very gentle and meet people where they are in this, that we understand it is understandable if, if there's a long history here, if it's understandable, if there's a lot of fear or stories in your head about what kind of response am I going to get or what kind of reaction am I going to get or what, what am I afraid of? I think just meeting, um, meeting someone there and talking about it, exploring that first right? Like what are some of the core beliefs that you hold around this? And what is some of the history? Because like you said, Greg, it it makes sense that for a time, not having that conflict or not having that strong reaction or that strong emotion or not being fill in the blank, whatever that the cost may be, um, it certainly is understandable. But paying attention to what does this cost us in the long term? What happens to us? Where do we go? And I know we work with a lot of women and I'm sure a lot of men too, that just, they've really lost themselves because they haven't had that voice. They haven't identified what do they need um, along the way. I think what's also true is if you grew up in an environment where boundaries weren't honored, that's what's normative. That that's what you expect. You, you don't see it as a violation of a boundary. You just see it. That's the way that we relate. And I know this is you know true in my own story where there's enmeshment where there's this um, overinvestment that's actually seen as love and intimacy. And so it really is difficult because I'm not only having to define a boundary, I'm having to redefine what intimacy and love is when I grew up in an environment of enmeshment and um, what we would refer to as emotional incest, where a child becomes responsible for the adult's emotional well-being. Mm-hmm. So as children, whatever is modeled for us is what's normal for us and then becomes the blueprint that we use to live our lives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, two thoughts come to me as you say that. The first one is- You're brilliant. Where, yeah, yes, of course, you're, you're brilliant. That was yes, not coming to mind for me. But maybe. <laughs> I was just waiting for us to- uh, but. Yes. Okay, so the first one is that if a child grew up in an environment where um, they basically, you know, focused around the parent, like they were the son, you know, and the rest of the family had to like circle around that, then it's going to be really challenging for a child to even know what their needs are. Mm -hmm. They were overly attuned to the needs of their parents in a backwards kind of way, because that's supposed to be parents, you know, attuned to the needs of the children. What happens then is those children grow up and have never had that practice of asking, what do I need? So we acknowledge this is, you know, this is hard work for Mm -hmm. that piece alone. Another thing that makes this work challenging is if we grew up in church cultures that told us that naming needs is selfish, that self-care is selfish. 
that the only way to be a quote good Christian is by always saying yes to whatever is asked of us. And I think we have to call that out and say, I, you know, I think that's a, a false understanding of what it means to be a Christ follower. Mm -hmm. If we look at how Jesus responded, Jesus pulled away at times. Jesus set limits. There were people in need and Jesus got in a boat and went on the other side of the lake. There were times when Jesus lovingly but firmly pushed back. And I think of the example when parents were trying to bring their children to him and the disciples were um, kind of uh, shooing the parents. Jesus said, no, no, let, let them come. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of examples where he speaks up and says, hey, hold on. I mean, that honestly, that's a good way to understand a boundary, right? Is when we're feeling uncomfortable, like this doesn't, square this isn't congruent for me hey hold on mm -hmm. what, what's interesting about the example that you gave of jesus and the uh, disciples limiting the children's engagement is the the um, the disciples were trying to create a boundary yeah. they believed yeah, sure. that they were protecting jesus from the whatever the complexity of children the noise of children the disruption of children and so they falsely were creating a boundary that Jesus didn't need or desire. And so that's a great example of we have to pay attention because sometimes we create a boundary that actually is destructive. And we do that out of our fear, our anxiety, but we keep others away. And in fact, isolation is a false boundary. Mm -hmm. When we isolate and we push other people away, we're trying to create a boundary but the creation of that boundary actually becomes destructive. Mm -hmm. what, what's interesting is, again, in that, that example of the, the parent that's the center of the universe, we watch that as children. That's what it looks like to be an adult or look like to be a parent. And so one of the things that can happen is I grow up to become the adult that believes I am the center of the universe or I'm supposed to be. And so what, what's challenging is when we observe adults who don't draw boundaries well, there can be a variety of different things that we do to cope with that. And one of the things that we can do is adopt their strategy and then duplicate it in our lives as adults. Yeah. I, I think this is a good place to say that learning to name needs and set healthy boundaries is hard, necessary work that really we're going to need a therapist help with quite often, mm -hmm. especially if um, boundaries were really crossed for us as children, they weren't honored, we didn't see it modeled, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be work that I need to sit and process with my therapist. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was having a conversation with my own therapist a few months ago, and I love this. She said to me, okay, help me understand why you twist yourself into such a pretzel about this. You know, why, why aren't you naming your needs? Why are you just contorting yourself to fit into that situation? And it, it was, you know, like I kind of laughed when she said it, but I thought I need to be called out about this, right? I, I, we just can't always see ourselves. And so we need good help to say, hey, what, what are your other choices here? Right. I, I would also add, this is also a place for community, that there's nothing like a community of men or a community of women that are seeing us in ways that maybe we're not able to see ourselves and challenging us in that. Yeah. And so um, there's nothing more eye opening than a peer saying, hey, I used to do that, too, or I struggled with this. Or, you know what, I used to have the same relationship with my mother and invite them to consider looking at it differently. Yeah. Well, I think this is a great place for us to end. And there's more to this conversation. So we're planning to do another podcast. And what might be some of the things that we can talk about the next time that we get together when it comes to boundaries? Yeah. Elizabeth, go ahead. Well, I think we'll talk a little bit about just 
you started alluding here, Greg, but just how do we start to form healthy boundaries? What does that look like? What does what do they sound like? I mean, maybe even how to how to word them. How do we speak them from our hoop? Um, what can we expect? You know, what what do healthy boundaries lead to? And and talking about what do we do if they're not met? Mm-hmm. You know, what are some steps we can take if those boundaries are not met? Well, well and I don't a- want to do a spoiler alert, but typically when we begin to draw boundaries, it leads to conflict. So oh. we'll look forward to that conversation. No, <laughs> nobody creates a teaser better than you guys. <laughs> we got well, Beth and Elizabeth and Greg, we want to thank you for joining us to the and True podcast. This has really been a, a great conversation, and we look forward to part two uh, on this conversation about boundaries. Uh, to our listeners and viewers, we thank you for joining us again today. Your loyalty is really much appreciated by all of us, and we hope that these podcasts are serving a very strong and moving uh, benefit for you in, in your life. If you're an individual that is hearing these messages and realizing that uh, there's a, a struggle going on, I mean, you're, you're a man who has compulsive, unwanted sexual behaviors, faithful and true, uh, is has got the help available that you're looking for. Visit our website, faithfulandtrue.com. Uh, go to our workshops and uh, click on the Men's Journey Workshop. Uh, there you'll find all the information. You'll find a video that will answer the most frequently asked questions that men have about that uh, intensive event. We also have information the Women's Journey Workshop. That's for the spouses of these same men who struggle. And then we have our couples uh, journey workshop. So uh, lots of offerings for you. Over 400 podcasts like this, uh, both uh, old and new for you to enjoy. And we uh, invite you to do that. We also have our online store with all of the healing resources uh, by Mark and Debbie Laser and other staff members uh, here at Faithful and True. So we join you again with part two of this conversation. We hope that this coming week for you will be filled with many blessings and with great vision.